Oh, it's right there with Sharon. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Welcome. Sharon. Sam, I didn't think that you would need to turn, but you will for the cover. Okay. Okay. And did I give you the society Yes. And now we just have to pass. Thank you, John. Thank you. online and friends here in the sanctuary at Green Sky Hill Indian United Methodist Church. And even if it, this is your first time here at Izzy, um, uh, we have a guest from Interlocking Public Radio, so um, you may be interviewed uh, voluntarily after church. No one is compelled to be interviewed. Um, welcome. We are celebrating the first Sunday of Advent in a, a brand new series called The Gift of Being Present. And for this first Sunday of Advent, we are going to be celebrating uh, the presence of hope, being present with hope. Just a couple of really quick announcements. Uh, right after church is a big party. So online, if you uh, can't make it to the service, but you can make it to the party, come on. We're going we're gonna to do some decorating this morning and um, then uh, have a potluck and play the greedy gift game. So we have extra gifts. If, if you didn't bring one and you weren't planning on staying, please stay. If you didn't bring food and so you weren't, uh, you're worried if you're, there'll be enough, there will be enough. You're invited to stay. Um, I also want to express my gratitude for everybody's participation uh, for my birthday fundraiser and what immediately followed a Giving Tuesday fundraiser <coughs> for Green Sky Hill. And uh, our community and friends were so generous that we raised uh, over 1,600 on the birthday online part, over 300 on the Giving Tuesday part so far, and in the mail and in the basket, another 650 or so. So you all raised 2,570 plus dollars. And that goes, that goes into the general fund for Pastor Sarah and the council to decide what to do with. Uh, it's available for whatever the church needs, and I'm very thankful uh, that you all participated. I'd like to uh, invite uh, Margo, and anybody that wants to help Margo, ring the bell, uh, and we will uh, then uh, be welcomed into worship with the drum voices of Green Sky Hill. And ladies, uh, sisters, you can come forward.
Yes, please. She's on her way up, I think. <clears throat> oh, she's... Advent is all about waiting, and we're going to find something to do together while we're waiting. Uh, welcome, sisters. Please sing. Uh, before we do this, I want to make an announcement. Okay. On um, Saturday, December 16th, there's going to be a murdered and missing Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit workshop here again. This will follow up from the one we did in May of 22. Um, on Friday afternoon, the Michigan Public Service Commission approved the 17-foot diameter tunnel in, under the Straits of Mackinac for Embridge Line 5. And so the man camps are, will be coming. And um, their, uh, Embridge is saying they're going to bring 1,200 men here um, for six to eight years, because that's how long it will take to drill the tunnel. So I welcome you all to come here on the 16th of December and participate in that. And I would like to encourage you to come to that. We were able to participate in the first one. It was very informative and also practical of what we can do about this terrible situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hope, uh, 
uh, reading, healing, coping service. I don't know if you mentioned that or not. So I didn't mean to commit Sharon to that. <laughs> In fact, I did not commit her to that. Um, if you, if you're probably familiar with Blue Christmas services. It's that kind of a service. It's a service to go and acknowledge the complexity of the season. Um, there are folks in this room who are celebrating this big holiday for the first time without a loved one that was here last time. Um, there are folks in this room and online with us who never, ever had the Christmas that they saw on television. Um, and yet, we can be present with hope, um, acknowledging those difficulties. The service is called Grieving, Healing, Hoping. It's going to be at the First Presbyterian Church in Boyne City. It's a community service. Uh, so all churches, many churches are participating and everyone is welcome. And it's happening on 4 p.m., at 4 p.m. on Sunday the 17th, on the Sunday before Christmas Eve. I'll be gone the next two Sundays. Um, Sarah, uh, I'm sorry, Pastor Sharon, who did an amazing job uh, for her first time uh, filling the pulpit here uh, recently, is, is doing next week's service. And Pastor Tim is going to be here on the 17th in the morning. This morning, Pastor Sarah, can you believe this tiny little church has all of these pastors? Um, <laughs> Pastor Sarah and Trent are getting a much needed uh, getaway this weekend. Uh, before she takes over and after the passing of the mantle service on the 31st. So I'll be here for both services on Christmas Eve, 10 a.m. and, and uh, 6 p.m. And then I'll be here for my final uh, Sunday morning service as your pastor on uh, the, the Sunday uh, after Christmas, uh, Christmas Eve, I'm sorry, New Year's Eve day, uh, 10 o'clock on the 31st. During that service, we will... Um, acknowledge the conclusion of the Advent Christmas season, um, and then uh, have a passing of the mantle where, where um, there is a beautiful stole that Pastor Tim passed to me uh, 10 years ago, 10 and a half years ago, that I am going to pass to uh, Sarah, and we will pray over her and um, acknowledge her uh, calling to be the pastor of this church. So we have so much to look forward to. And it's going to take at least a month. <laughs> because waiting is the season. And one of my favorite songs is Mr. Rogers' uh, There's Something to Do While We Wait. And that's your invitation this morning. While we're waiting for things to be made the way they were intended to be at creation, what can we do while we're waiting? Each Sunday of this uh, service will be singing a couple of uh, songs, um, uh, what we call a threshold welcoming into the moment song at the beginning that we're about to learn together. And then again, um, a prayer song that we'll sing during prayer time and a version during communion this morning. So we're learning two brand new songs. Be patient with yourself. I'm going to smile and enjoy you learning these songs that I've been learning. Um, and we also have a, a quite unfamiliar hymn for both for most of us. So I would love to tell you that the worship planning team decided that the best way to bring people into the Advent season and the frustration of waiting is to actually make you frustrated. <laughs> but that's not the intention. Let's enter into this beautiful new series, The Gift of Being Present with this video welcome and song. The first time you see the words to the song, um, we'll listen to them together, and the second time we'll sing it together. Advent can be filled with worry about finding the perfect Christmas gifts. Deep down, we want people in our lives to know they are special and that we love them. But sometimes we overlook the greatest gift of all, our very presence. The 19th century poet Christina Rossetti wrote in the bleak midwinter that became a popular Christmas carol. Modern composer Mark Hayes set the last verse of that poem to music as our theme song for our Advent Christmas series. It reminds us that even if we are feeling poor in resources, in body or spirit, we can simply be a gift of presence. We can give our hearts.
great anticipation for the gift that God will reveal. The promise of hope is the divine gift. didn't realize or remember that the first time the song was sung, the words would not be on the screen. So, uh, But we'll have plenty of other opportunities to learn that beautiful song and sing it together in different verses. We're going to try to sing this song together, and I invite you to stand in spirit or in body if you're comfortable. Um, what gift can we bring? You probably want to use your hymnal here in the sanctuary. Uh, the words will be on the screen. If you don't follow music, the hymnal will not be very helpful for you. Um, <laughs> but follow the rest of us. And Sharon's going to play the melody through for us, and then we'll uh, sing all four verses. And I invite you to stand. Mm -hmm. second, third, fourth verses, she can join us with a compliment. Ready? Let's try. What gift can we bring? What present? What token? What words can convey it? The joy of this day. When grateful we come, remembering, rejoicing, what song can we Um, sing it through real fast on line, folks. Okay, now join us for the second verse. <laughs> Give thanks for the past, for those who had vision, who planted and watered so dreams could come true. Give thanks for the now, for study, for worship. Thank you. 
to introverts, so if you don't want anybody to touch you or get too close, wave, and they know that's your sign. Otherwise, uh, feel free, to, with permission, to touch one of them. The, the peace of Creator sets free, be with you. Good, good for you. Scripture passages. This series follows the um, Revised Standard, Revised Common Lectionary, um, and this is the first day of the new year for the church. So globally, uh, many churches still are following uh, Advent as the first day of the church calendar and sharing these same readings with us. We're reading from the Inclusive Bible for two passages, all three actually, and then uh, I'm going to add. Beautiful First Nations version for the Corinthians passage, uh, just because it's really helpful and beautiful to hear it slightly differently. Um, the Book of Psalms was the songbook of the Hebrew people. It's kind of like the hymnal that we're using. Um, whatever written versions they had were songs that had been sung and passed by storytellers from generation to generation, uh, and then new songs were added as they gathered uh, to worship. Uh, Psalm 80 was written in a time when the people were exiled from their homeland. Uh, in it, we hear the conviction that God will restore the people. These psalms, I always imagine, are many indigenous relatives who uh, experience forced relocation, uh, the Trail of Tears, the, the um, removal from, of our Potawatomi uh, siblings in southwest Michigan, uh, forcibly by the U.S. military. Um, half of the Ojibwe uh, community up here who um, decided not to wait for the federal government to evict them, but to maintain the culture by going to Canada. Uh, and thanks be to God, thank you, Creator, that that happened because the language came back. Uh, they maintained the language in many of the traditional ways that the local tribe members who found a way to survive without being forced to remove, we're able to re-inculcate uh, into the tribal experience here. So I think there's a strong identification with these psalms and any people, people now that are experiencing colonized um, removal from their homeland would identify with these and the hope that is present. You'll hear some names of places that may not be familiar, but you can fill it in with places where you hope life will be restored. Psalm 80, verses 1 through 2 in the Inclusive Bible. Shepherd of Israel, hear us. You who led Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned on the cherubim, shine out. Shine out before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Awaken your power and come to save us. O oh God, return to us. Let your face smile on us, and we will be saved. That's such a loaded word. If you grew up in a fundamentalist or, or, or conservative uh, evangelical tradition, um, the word saved, as beautiful it is, as it is for some who found their new relationship with Christ, <clears throat> is very loaded for others for whom it became, uh, am I really, am I in or am I out kind of thinking. When in fact, the text has nothing to do with that. The text is really quite literal. It's a people and waiting to be saved by the creator who made them from the colonizers who are trying to destroy their culture. And for each of us personally, it is an invitation to live in the presence of creator now and forever. 
Uh, it's a it's a literally a rescue, not a who gets to go to heaven and who doesn't. Another community at a later time, the early Christians who lived in a time of oppression by the Roman occupiers, and by the way, didn't call themselves Christians. Uh, they were uh, followers of the way. They were Jews who, for the, at, the, at the outset, Hebrew people, who realized that this uh, promised one um, was more than a prophet. They lived in a time also of oppression by the Roman occupiers. The letters that circulated among them gave them hope for the future. Hear this excerpt from the first letter to the Corinthians. I'll read it first from the Inclusive Bible and then from the First Nations Version. And if you'd like to follow along, that's on page 299 in your, in your pew Bible. From the Inclusive Bible, I continually thank my God for you, uh, the writer of this letter to the church at Corinth, uh, said, I continually thank my God for you because of the gift bestowed on you in Christ Jesus in whom you have been richly endowed with every gift of speech and knowledge. In the same way, the testimony about Christ has been so confirmed among you that you lack no spiritual gift as you wait for the revelation of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And hear this version from the First Nations Bible. Uh, the letter here is called First Letter from Small Man to the Sacred Family in Village of Pleasure. I cannot help but delight every single time I read that name that they chose for the man most of us know as the Apostle Paul. Because if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, um, he had no lack of ego. Um, he had to deal with that his entire life as he followed uh, Jesus. So I can't imagine that he would have loved being called small man. Um, <laughs> From small man to the sacred family in village of pleasure. Um, we must have a, a, a town or city in, oh, paradise, here in Michigan that may be similar. So here's uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 7 in the First Nations Version. I am always giving thanks to Creator for you, for the gift of Creator's great kindness given for the gift of his great kindness given to you in Creator Sets Free, the Chosen One. He has blessed you with the right words to speak and a deep understanding of all things, so we can now be sure that your lives are telling the true story of the Chosen One. This shows that you have all the spiritual gifts you need as you wait with pounding hearts for the great revealing of our honored Chief Creator Sets Free the Chosen One. That passage is so encouraging and beautiful to me. Um, I promise, well, I'll try anyway, that these next few weeks won't be a long goodbye on my part. Uh, but I can't help but think of this community of ours in the last decade. And uh, last Friday, we had another Sacred Spaces uh, Clean Energy Grant check-in. Uh, with EcoWorks, who is doing the planning for all of our energy upgrades so that we stop feeding uh, uh, harmful gases into, the, into our environment, so that we will stay on the grid, but we're going to be giving uh, clean energy back to the grid through our, through our parallel project uh, with Solar Faithful to put solar panels on that roof. And in that Zoom meeting with um, uh, our colleague from the Michigan Interfaith Power and Light, from EcoWorks and uh, Robin and Peggy and um, who am I forgetting? Um, Duffy's usually there and he had other business that, that morning. Um, and Sarah Schaefer. It was Sarah's first uh, connection with that team because she's going to be taking over the leading of that project with the rest of the team. And what, what I was so profoundly aware of is that this is true for Green Sky Hill. Creator has blessed you with the right words to speak and a deep understanding of all things so that you can be sure that your lives are telling the true story of the Chosen One. And this shows that you have all the spiritual gifts you need as you wait with pounding hearts for the great revealing of our honored Chief. 
we have such a great team. I can actually let go of things that I've been worried about because others are taking care of it. I told Kathy this morning or last night when I stopped by here for a few minutes that it's a shame that it took me all of this time, the last uh, 10 or 15 days of my appointment here, to realize that if I just left things to be done by other people, they would actually get done. Um, I was on vacation last week, sadly sick for the entire vacation, but at least I didn't have to worry about what was happening here. All of the setup, the tree, the mural, um, the uh, uh, ornaments that are going to be placed under the tree at some point, um, the hall being prepared for our gathering today, um, others took care of that, and I didn't even have to think about it. And may you please make that true for Sarah uh, moving forward. No pastor, even of one who's actually appointed full-time, can do all that needs to happen in a church. And when you're appointed half-time, it's on all of you to make sure that you're not expecting her to work full-time. Please. And I know you can do it because you have all the gifts you need uh, between you. It's not any one person having all the gifts, right? It's all of you and all of your gifts and all of you and all of your gifts. I continually thank Creator for you. Our Gospel reading is from Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 37. And this is one of those passages that for people like me makes you appreciate the Revised Common Lectionary because I would just avoid this passage altogether. Um, this is a lovely translation. In light of what I mentioned earlier about the way that Scripture has been used to create trauma in people's lives, I'm, I really, I'm not sure if you can do this, but I want to invite you to do this. Set aside all of the end times teaching you've ever heard in your entire life. The, back from our era, Kathy and I, when we were in college and the film The Rapture literally scared the hell out of us. Um, contemporary times, uh, the whole book series left behind. Um, we, I'm, after I retire and after I'm gone for a year, look me up. I mean, not literally. We're going to stay on Prospect Street in Charlevoix, but I just need to have a really healthy boundary for me and for you and for Sarah. So after a while, if you want to talk more about why that's such terrible theology, I'd love to talk with you about it. But that's not the main point of today. It's just that this is one of the passages that has been used by that kind of teaching to use fear as a way to motivate people to become a follower of Christ. It works, and it's terrible. Because you're not really ever sure if you're following because you think this is true. This teacher who's offering a different way of living in this world or because you're afraid of the consequences of not doing it. Um, so lay that aside. If it starts popping up in your head while you're hearing this passage, use your own internal um, adjectives <laughs> to say, shut up to that lie. Okay, And hear this, if you can, as um, Creator sets free in the middle of... Um, recognizing what the empire is doing and what they're about to do to him specifically and telling all of his followers again some really hard things are about to happen. Really hard things. All of this stuff and the, the signs of the uh, end of the days kind of passages that happen right before this um, are happening right before he's arrested and it has a mock trial. So a lot of it has to very... very specifically to do with that moment, especially when you think in context of him saying that before this generation has passed, these things will happen. So very clearly, just from that context, this is not about some future day. In some ways it is, which makes it complicated. But the main point is not about some future day when the people who manage to get in are going to be removed from this difficulty and everybody else is going to meet some terrible military destruction. Those metaphors made sense to people then. If you 
are in Palestine or Israel or many other parts of the world, similar metaphors make sense to you now. That you're waiting for things to be made right and you want God to save you. I hope you can hear this as I am applying it this morning, which is that even when life around you or just the news makes you feel like the world is about to come to an end, even when you feel that way, there is hope and you have to wait for it. Here's the passage. But in those days, after that time of distress, the sun will be darkened, the moon will lose its brightness, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the promised one coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then the angels will be sent to gather the chosen from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Take the fig tree as a parable. As soon as its twigs grow supple and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, know that the promised one is near, right at the door. The truth is, before this generation has passed away, all these things will have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But as for the day or hour, nobody knows it, neither the angels of heaven nor the only begotten, no one but Abba God. Be constantly on the watch, stay awake, you do not know what the appointed time will, when the appointed time will come. It's like people traveling abroad. They leave their home and put the workers in charge, each with a certain task. And those who watch at the front gate are ordered to stay on the alert. So stay alert. You do not know when the owner of the house is coming, whether at dusk or midnight, when the cock crows or at early dawn. Do not let the owner come suddenly and catch you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, stay alert. I know it's hard if you've heard all that other stuff to leave it behind for a minute. Can we let that be our left behind? We left behind that really uh, toxic theology. I think that this is a very dramatic, poetic encouragement to those folks in their moment of feeling like the world was about to end and in our moment of feeling like the world is about to end, of mindfulness, before that was a hip phrase. It's pay attention because even when things feel and look horrible, the Christ is present. And can you imagine the next few moments in the lives of the first followers when the soldiers showed up? at their door, how helpful that reminder to them would be, oh man, this is bad, <laughs> this is really bad. But Jesus just told us that he's still right here, he's still near. It happened in that generation, before that generation ended, and many followers of Christ have been looking to the heavens for millennium, millennia now, waiting with a very literal interpretation of what that might mean, and missing completely uh, the presence of the Christ in today's trauma. It means much more than that, and plus none of us know exactly what it means. It's a word from Creator for all of creation that we can find hope in if we are ready to be present with hope. And it's a slow work. Oh my goodness, it's a slow work. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin wrote a prayer for us that we will conclude my sermon with this morning. It opens, above all, trust in the slow work of God. And the beautiful prayer elaborates on that, and I hope we'll leave you with hope. So what do we do while we're waiting? What do we do when we turn the news on and have to immediately turn it off? Caitlin Curtis, who wrote Living Resistance and who was our guest this summer, has been writing a series of blogs about uh, leaving church. And it's, it's, it's not encouraging anybody to do that, it's just talking to everybody who is. 
Um, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting my teachers mixed up. Carrie Newcomer, who is a singer, songwriter, who Kathy and I also follow <coughs> on Substack, both of them I, we just follow on Substack. Carrie Newcomer shared last week or a couple weeks ago, around Thanksgiving, that she turned the news on and just the first images that she saw before she heard anything at all took her to a place so deep and dark that she had to spend the next several hours um, in mindfulness practices to, to um, get that out of her head. And so one thing to do while we're waiting is to be very mindful about what we put into our heads. Um, it's hard. I would keep the news on all day long. I, I would, because I want to be aware, I don't want to be, I don't want my head in the sand. There are awful things that are happening and we all need to resist. But none of us can resist if we're overpowered by despair. So one thing to do is to, to moderate that. Uh, one of our therapists recommended, why don't you commit to a specific amount of time each day and stop after that, whatever your mind and heart and body can half an hour instead of 8 or 16 hours of that content. Find a trustworthy news source that isn't left or right trying to scare you into accept, uh, following their view of things. That's hard, but they're, they're out there. You can find sources that are tell, will tell you what's going on and give you uh, some insight as to what we might need to do about it without um, it, uh, catastrophizing everything. Um, and then this beautiful invitation of what we can do while we're waiting from another uh, friend of the green sky and our, our siblings, uh, Robin Wall Kemmerer, who Pastor Sharon quoted from very recently. Um, I, watched, I was able to watch, I, I couldn't get down to uh, Grand Valley State University for Robin's um, presentation there, but I was able to stream it. And she contrasted in the same way that the Christ was contrasting for the first listeners to that passage that we just read, there's this kind of empire that does things this way. And it's all about violence and power. And there's our kingdom <clears throat> that is all about sacrificial love and including, including loving our enemy, as impossible as that is. There are very different kingdoms and kingdoms. And Robin put it this way. One asks the question, what more can we take? So we have to deal with a giant tunnel under the straits. We're invited, Robin reminded us, to ask, what does the earth ask of us? Instead of what more can we take, what does the earth ask of us? And her answer, and it's elaborated wonderfully in the rest of Braiding Sweetgrass and any teaching you can find from her, what the earth asks of us is gratitude, which was our whole last series, and reciprocity. And reciprocity is, at its very most basic level, I'm going to give back more than I take. When something is shared with me, I'm going to share and she asked these clarifying questions about what we can do while we're waiting. Is the land primarily a source of belongings? Or is land primarily a source of belonging? That's what the Green Sky Hill Anishinaabe Conservancy is all about. And that is also happening. Um, maybe not fully every I and T before the end of this year, but maybe. Uh, we're very close. We um, have approval for the land transfer, both from the congregation and the um, folks above that that make that have to give us approval. Um, paperwork is with a local title attorney who is reviewing to make sure that the current warranty deeds can be transferred from the Green Sky Hill Church to the Green Sky Hill Conservancy. Uh, and the lease is almost settled between the church and the conservancy so that we can still do this forever 
uh, without any significant any change in how we do church. But this land, all the way down to the water, all the way down to the curves on the road down the hill, um, to those woods, to the, just the other side of this building, will all be protected forever. Um, so that this congregation, Green Sky Hill natives, will have our land back. And our good neighbor, the Purdy's, who have what used to be Green Sky Hill land, are putting their land into a, conser a, a conservancy easement so that it too will never be developed. Thanks be to God. Those are things that we can do while we're waiting. Those are the things that the Christ is saying, look, I know it looks bad. There are really mean people. <laughs> a lot of them are in power. And they're taking, taking, taking at your expense. I'm right here. I'm so near. Trust in the slow work of God. Amen. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. Quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We should like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. And yet it is the law of all progress that is made by passing through some stages of instability. The smile on my face is because I'm imagining this entire room and everyone online saying, are we there yet? <laughs> I am intentionally inviting us to be uncomfortable. I don't want that for you. I just know that that's part of the process. And we can be present with hope in those uncomfortable feelings. First time through this new song, our prayer song for this morning in the series, um, is an invitation to listen as prayer. And then you'll see the words um, 
on the screen at various intervals and you'll be invited to continue listening if it works best for you or try to sing uh, the words uh, together as well. The first question is, who was a gift of presence to you this week? Did you experience their attention in a way that felt like a special connection? Take a moment to recall this in your mind's eye, seeing it emerge like opening a gift. And if you can't recall such a moment, it's okay. This week, you will notice these moments more deeply. The second question is this, how did you offer yourself as a gift of presence? What did it feel like to extend your attentiveness and availability beyond yourself? Did you notice how it made a difference to someone else for you to be fully, truly present to them? The third question is this, is it possible that God's presence is felt more acutely in these moments when we truly tend to one another? What could you do this coming week that would allow God's gift of hope to flow through you to someone else? It may be as simple as finding opportunities to speak an encouraging word, or as complex as actually lifting up someone's circumstances through volunteering or donating. And I invite you to open your eyes. Before we sing together and continue in prayer, it's not my story to tell, so I'm leaving names out. Uh, that person happens to be here this morning they wish to share their story with you during fellowship time, I encourage that person, unnamed and unidentified, to do so. But one of your siblings here in church this morning put into practice the very complex of actually lifting up someone else's circumstances through volunteering this last week. And that person who received the volunteer help 
um, shared with me such gratitude. And the, the recipient's life was changed by that act. That's what the African proverb calls putting feet to our prayer. Let's sing this together. Or listen if you wish. Kathy and I were talking about gift wrapping this morning, and I said, you should see the simple wrap we used for, for communion. It's just a cloth. And Judy said, that's what we're supposed to be doing now. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of using up paper. So. But don't feel guilty during the party. <laughs> a lot of paper. <laughs> Sharon is continuing to 
prepare the meal, let's continue in our liturgy together. You'll find uh, moments to respond um, on the screen. And so with your people, 
and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are they who come in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised the gift of his presence with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. And share in these words with me. They all came together at the table that night. He broke bread and said, this is my body, broken for you, and also for you. Take, eat, remember, do this and believe. Let us partake together. I meant to tell you, in case it's a concern, this is a gluten-free cracker. We're taking the cup together this morning in the form of the fruit of the vine. And let's share in these words together. Whenever you gather, know of my promise. This now is poured out to offer my love. Take, drink, remember. Do this and believe. And so, in remembrance of your mighty gifts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's gift for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be, for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his love. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in beauty and harmony to make all things whole again. And we feast together at Christ's great open banquet. Together. Jesus, the, the Christ, and with the Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, yours living God. We know and believe that what we must do is open. Mishnah, 
As forgiven and reconciled people, we offer ourselves freely, guilt-free, without uh, being compelled by some empire, to give what we can give as a way of putting feet to our prayers, to be present with hope. You'll find a round basket at the door. I gave you such a good cue, too, that I just kept talking. <laughs> You'll find a round basket for the ministry of Green Sky Hill, all the things that you've heard us talk about um, at the door when you leave, uh, if you have gifts to share there. And the picnic-style basket is for disaster relief. Um, that's through the United Methodist Committee on Relief. And online, please use our website, greenskyhill.org and the donate button there, or you'll find the address to mail uh, your gifts to the church. And now, will you stand for the doxology and for our closing carol and benediction?
regarding it. Oh, thank you. I'll make you real. I want to grab my coat.